Welcome to Your Gal Friday, a podcast about female leaders, innovators, and rule breakers. Each week, your hosts, Leah and Phoebe, will shine a spotlight on an amazing gal and talk about what we can all learn from her. Brought to you by Gal's Guide to the Galaxy. Welcome to Your Gal Friday. I am Dr. Leah Leach. And I'm Phoebe Freer. Today we are talking about a gal who had amazing success in golf, basketball, and track and field. But it doesn't stop there. She also played baseball, billiards, and bowling. All of these events at a time when women were discouraged to even compete. ESPN ranked her in the top 10 of the most important athletes of the 20th century. Today, we're talking about the life and legacy of your gal, Babe Didrison Zaharias. Yay! So, Phoebe, what did you know about Babe before we started our research? Well, I knew nothing. I had no idea who she was, but when you told me about her, I was pretty excited because we were trying to look for gals who kind of covered different areas in sports and babe definitely qualifies she covers basically all of the sports so i think that um we we could have just covered her for sports gals and still would have done yeah it would have been done yeah she would have been a potpourri (laughs) exactly it was just like oh we're done we covered all of the sports okay cool (laughs) (laughs) exactly but wait oh different kinds of personalities i guess that helps too (laughs) oh yeah you know (laughs) so we yeah you know i actually thought and i think i mentioned it in the prologue i thought she was that google doodle that we saw right but i can't find it i don't think she was i can't even find who that was now at this point (laughs) google why you do this to us i know and I thought I and and Babe was on our list at yeah. the right time. We would have seen that Google Doodle, so maybe. But like, so I just can't confirm that you know uh, that she was that one. So basically, if she was not that Google Doodle, I have never heard of Babe before, and I feel really bad because right. I feel like I should have heard of her. Uh, she is the definition of an all around athlete. Oh She's, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm amazed by her. I really am. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's a definition of overachiever. Um, right. Or just, you know what? Girls got to play. You know totally. what I mean? Like, you it's have so that, cool. Yeah. She's got to play whatever's available, you know, bat a ball, a court, give me it. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm on play. <laughs> Well, before she got things done, where did she grow up? How did she start? Well, Babe Didrikson Zaharias was born as Mildred Ella Didrikson on June 26th of 1911 in Port Arthur, Texas. Now, she was known for adding a bit of exaggeration to her life, and she claimed in her autobiography that she was actually born in 1914, but it really was 1911. And we'll get more into why she did that. A little later. Yeah, and it's also not the first time or the last time that she exaggerates something. Exactly. <laughs> it's just like, right off the bat, there you go, she she exaggerated. Just just a smidge. It started when I was born. Exaggerated. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, per- exactly. Now, her parents were poor Norwegian immigrants, and Babe was the sixth child out of seven. Her father, Ole, was a sea merchant, and Babe would love to hear the tale of her father's trips at sea. He had a very deep love for storytelling, even if that meant the true story was a twee bit, was was a wee bit exaggerated. Oh, I see where she gets it now. Exactly. (laughs) She grew up with it. It it was a normal thing for her. Um, Babe picked up on it and learned it and used it to her own retelling of her own story. Now, Babe's mother was Hannah Marie Olson, and she supported her family by starting an in-home business of washing clothes and doing, quote, woman's work for other people. Now, Port Arthur, Texas, was vastly different from Norway. Texas was hot and humid, and Norway was cool and had longer, darker winters. And the family took a while to adjust, especially her mother. I mean, they basically moved from one hemisphere to another so that's kind of a drastic thing it is a rapid change for sure yeah now the start of babe's name so her mom used to call mildred ella either millie or mine babe or mini babe so in norwegian um baden means baby so hers was an affectionate broken english nickname for her daughter 
Now, as a kid, Babe loved to brag that her nickname was derived from, of course, Babe Ruth. The legend, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. He's this huge baseball star, and she loves sports, you know, since she was younger. So, of course, she's gonna say it's it was Babe Ruth, like my Leah and Princess Leia type thing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> So, because of Babe's in, like enamorment with Babe Ruth, she um, took on the nickname. She kept it. She took um, the name Baby and turned it into Babe. Now, she told this story very, very so often that it stuck. People thought that she was called that because of Babe Ruth, not because of her mother's term of endearment. Now, ah. yeah. In later years, of course, sports writers also helped embellish the legend and that it was attached to her nickname. Oh, yeah. It's a good story. It is. It, it, makes, right. it makes a good story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, when Babe was growing up, she was the fearless daredevil of the family. Her family endured hurricanes, and Babe was the one who ran after the chickens and other objects in the middle of the storm at a very uh, young age. Like, three years old, she was running after chickens in a hurricane. So, <laughs> she's, <laughs> nice. she's fearless from the start. Now, she also liked to compete with other kids in the area in any sport they played. Now, because of being the ever-warm Texas, sports was very common and played super often because they had lots of warm weather time. Mm -hmm. So Babe would gladly put down her chores to join the game. She would make any excuse, be like, all right, I'm out, and go join and play the game. Mm -hmm. Now, her Norwegian parents encouraged her to pursue sports even at a young age. So instead of getting mad all the time, they, they eventually were just like, all right, you may as well go go play sports and right. and they obviously could tell she had um a knack for it and a, and a gift for it mm -hmm. now her parents supported their children in all their endeavors as long as they worked hard for it now babe was considered as tomboyish and her community growing up never really fit in well she never fit in very well she was often blamed for anything bad happening in the neighborhood like kids throwing a baseball in windows and Stuff like that. It was always blamed on her, even if it wasn't actually her fault. Well, when Babe was in her last year of high school, a basketball coach named Melvin J. McCombs read about Babe's victories on the court. Now, Melvin coached a women's semi-professional team, the Golden Cyclones, and they were sponsored by Employers Casualty Insurance Company. So Melvin traveled to see Babe play and offered her a place on the team once she graduated. Not only was the offer to play on the team, but teammates also had to work for the company sponsor. That way it's like a company team, but, totally. you know, they hired players to work at the company. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Babe wanted to start work right away way this was a major chance to make a living through sports that wasn't a gym teacher i mean really that was going to be her only option right so she simply didn't attend the last few months of school but she did return for her graduation <laughs> of course why not right exactly so convincing her parents was not easy to let her move to dallas and start a job but Babe would be able to help out with money and seeing how this opportunity came one year into the Great Depression, there was not many opportunities like this even available. That's very true. Yeah. So it was like too good to be true. She had right. to take it. <laughs> yeah. She had to take it right away before the offer was like off the table. Exactly. So you'd jump on it. Yep. So for her day job at Employers Casualty Insurance, Babe was a secretary and she could type and she could take shorthand, but she did exaggerate her skills. She said on her typing quote i think it was 86 words per minute now seeing how the average person types about 40 words per minute mm -hmm. uh this is of course again not the first and not the last of her over grandizements on or off any field <laughs> absolutely so because babe was being paid as a secretary and as an athlete she made more than some men and she sent a large portion of that home to her parents some say upwards of 75 percent of her check she sent home to her parents wow that's amazing. Yeah. So her coach, Melvin, wasn't the only one that didn't care for the conservative bloomer uniforms that athletes wore. He felt that women should be able to show off their athleticism and their physical form. Some called the Golden Cyclones uniforms scandalous, but they were satin tank tops and what felt like skimpy shorts, but they weren't skimpy. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I lived through the 70s and 80s. Those shorts are fine. Right. <laughs> 
But Melvin didn't feel like it exploited the gals, and Babe said she never felt exploited in the uniform either. Oh, that's good. That doesn't happen. I feel like that doesn't happen super often. (laughs) Right. Exactly. So in other words, it wasn't like a league of their own situation. Right. You know what I mean? That's exactly what I was thinking. How did you know? Yeah. (laughs) See, there you go. Yep. (laughs) Now, also, Texas was extremely supportive of female athletes in the stands and in the newspapers. The gals on teams were treated like local heroes. When Babe arrived at the Golden Cyclones, she dominated. They attracted 5,000 fans per game. And according to Susan E. Califf's book, Babe Dickerson, the greatest all-sport athlete of all time, quote, the Cyclones won 36 tournament championships, averaging 38 points per game while stifling their opponents to a measly 11. Wow. (laughs) Wow. They really dominated. They were winning and they were winning hard. Yeah. (laughs) Now, Babe earned All-American status twice while playing basketball. She scored 106 points in five games, although she'd say it was higher. And, of course, sometimes the papers actually said higher as well. Of course. (laughs) Of course. Now, Babe got a lot of attention, and she loved it. When Babe was invited to play for another team for more money and more benefits, she was all about it. However, regulations got in her way. So she asked Melvin for a raise, and he said no. So Babe protested by holding back on the court, and Melvin benched her. Babe knew her worth, and she fought for it at a time when women did not fight for equal pay, let alone any kind of pay. Holy crap. Right? Wow. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. (laughs) So when basketball season was over, she'd play on the company's softball team, and she won the AAU Softball Throw Championship in 1930 and in 1931. Whenever there was a break in the action, Babe would find a sport to play. She even did swimming exhibitions of platform diving, and she did doubles tennis. Melvin even created a swim team for Babe. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So on the off seasons, her basketball teammates gave golf lessons at the Dallas Country Club. Babe wasn't happy about her swing, and she would practice until her hand blistered, just trying to get better. At the time, it was the one sport that she couldn't master, and it really bothered her because she wanted to master it. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. So as hard as it is to imagine, Babe was bored when basketball was, uh, when basketball season was over. So Melvin suggested track and field, and you did some research on her track and field days. I did. Oh my goodness. It's hard to imagine being bored with the sport, but I mean, then again, as we're getting to know Babe, it makes a little more sense. Right. Off season, just, yeah, it can kill her if she's not playing something. Exactly. Now, track and field is an interesting sport. You're basically competing with yourself plus against others. It takes a lot of training and it's possible to push too hard. You're basically always building muscles and creating micro tears in, in order to build more muscles. Now, I'm not a pro athlete, but I am a runner or at least kind of a runner compared to Babe. You run more than me, so you're more of a runner than me. <laughs> Yay! Um, but I ran a 10K trail race, and I tripped a couple times. And just, Ouch. Yeah, and just that, that was like two or three months ago. I've had issues with my legs ever since. Now, Babe was a pro, and she pushed past pain like this, and she just trained harder. With track and field, you're always competing against yourself. You're always trying to better yourself. And by making yourself better, like your physical abilities better, then you can be, quote unquote, better than other people. It's just interesting. to It's not it's not really teamwork at all. It's all about your mental capability, your physical capabilities. It's it's a completely different, different thing. It's almost how much are you willing to push yourself? Exactly. And Babe was always willing to push herself out of that. Exactly. <laughs> it, I, I feel mm-hmm. like track and field really, this part of her life really shows her commitment to sports because it was really, there's a reason it's like your personal record, your personal best. Like you're going yeah. against yourself. You're going, you're trying to make yourself better. So that's all Babe did. That was her life. And track and field right. really showcase that that's 
that's what she was doing with her whole life. Now, she was a pro. She pushed past pain and everything. You train, you work, you win. That was her motto. She once won a track competition with a shard of glass in her heel. Yeah. She won at the Southern Methodist University. She didn't tell anybody about her energy about her injury and she still won it and people marveled at her success. She did not take no for an answer. She did not accept pain. She did not accept anything less than what she thought she could do. It, it's crazy. Now she said right after winning the six gold medals that she was going to train for the Olympics. So, in 1932, Babe went to the Olympics. She joined the Olympic competitors on the train to L.A., and she trained even on the moving, well, train. Um, She opened the car doors, and she ran through each car. She stretched, and on the way through the cars, she tried to psych out her opponents. Babe would go around saying how she was going to, quote, lick you single-handedly, meaning she was going to blow all the competitors out of the water, and she did just that. Mm-hmm. Confident girl. <laughs> oh, yeah. And she knew it, and she wanted to psych them out. It's all about... It, it's a strategy. It is, and it's <laughs> just as much about your mental capacity as it is about your physical capability. So it's... Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's playing dirty a little bit, but it's smart, you know? It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> now, this is where we get into Babe's age. When she started competing... She started misrepresenting her age as younger so that her accomplishments would seem grander. Now, maybe taking on the flair of the story a little too far, by the time she went to the Olympics, her age was already thought to be 19, but she was really 21. And she didn't correct it. All of her records said 19... All of her, uh, all of her documents said nineteen. Everything. But we can do math. We can do math. <laughs> now, in this time, there was discrimination against women, and it, it was still very big. There was a considerable amount of more men in the Olympics than women, like a lot. Now, due to yeah. the fact that they were scared of women's quote frail bodies, and that training too hard would damage their psych or damage themselves. To the point of unable to bear a child, which is crazy that they're like. They were really worried about that continuously in the 30s. It's like, yeah, really? it's like, really, it's not it's not really about you to worry about this. And also, right. we're not that frail. Thank you. Uh-huh, <laughs> I'm pretty exactly. I'm pretty sure men are more frail than that, but we're not going to get into this. Right. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they have more to worry about than we do. But OK. <laughs> right, but they're not worried about them not being able to have kids. Exactly. Wait a, Wait a minute here. <laughs> Wait a minute. Just let them play the game, my goodness. Exactly. <laughs> now, due to all of this, women were only allowed to compete in three events at the Olympics, which Babe was very upset about. But she, yeah, she wanted to do all of them. She wanted to do all of them. <laughs> Which maybe due to her getting hurt, it's good she didn't do. I don't know. I don't know. She wanted to do them all, right? And mm-hmm. that's always what critics are like. Well, maybe it's good. It was she was just in three, so she could excel mm-hmm. at three right. versus five or six, where you know what I mean. Yeah, it would go across the board, but no, like nothing exhausted her. So that's I don't. So know. true. I don't know it's about so that. So true. Now, uh, mm-hmm. now the three that she chose was the javelin, the eighty meter hurdles, and the high jump. When Bay was competing at the Olympics, her brother Bubba traveled from Texas to see her. He had only $2.50, but he found a way to hitchhike and get all the way to L.A. to see her. He arrived at her fancy hotel just to be kicked out and forced to wait for her outside. And she was so thrilled. He was the only one out of her family who could see her since they couldn't all afford to come out. Now, the press caught wind of Bubba's adventure, and they had a field day covering his story to go see her. They, like, Aww. figured out where he, wa- where he was, how he got there, because they knew he was basically hitchhiking. It was like, all right. It's a cute story, it though. It is. Yeah. It's so cute. Now, in the Olympics, the javelin was Babe's first uh, game, but she injured herself in her first throw. She still managed to set a re- world record, though, Despite all of that, she had two. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. She had two more throws, but she, again, never mentioned her injury. She never accepted this hindrance from herself. 
she won gold despite her injury. She set world records. She won. It's insane. She's crazy, but she's amazing. <laughs> but she's good. She's yeah. so good. Oh, my gosh. I've got, like, <laughs> joint issues, and I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can <laughs> run as much. And she's like, oh, I just almost broke my wrist throwing this, but, you know, I won right. gold, and I'm not going to tell anyone. Like, exactly. really? <laughs> it's what you do. It's what yeah. you do. Oh, like, it's a different mindset. It yeah. is. It's crazy. <laughs> Now, her next event was the 80-meter hurdles, where she came in first, but just barely. The yeah. silver medal winner for the 80-meter was Evelyn Hall, who was another Mer- American representative. She said that they were at least tied, and, e- and she even had a welt on her neck from the ribbon at the finish line. Oh, wow. Even despite all that, they still announced Babe as the winner. Babe had gained so much publicity at this point that it was difficult to dispute anyway because basically the public was on her side. Right. Okay. The PR campaign was in full effect. It was. So upon further examination, they did say that the two women were at least tied, but it was not disputed any further because they were both representing the USA. Now, if they were representing two different countries... It would have gone down yeah. a lot differently, but because they were both USA, they were just like, all right, silver and gold, we're going to leave it at that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I can unfortunately see that. Exactly. Yeah. Now, to kind of like similarly, her last event was the high jump, and this was against her rival. Now, upon the jump, Babe used a move that was considered illegal because she dove head first instead of feet first. Now, despite that, she won silver. But she was upset about getting silver and not gold. But the the crazy thing is, her medal was actually half gold and half silver because mm. of how close the competition was. Some people actually believe this was fair justice because of her previous win, but it was also questionable. There was people who were upset about this. They thought it was unfair and wanted her to continue getting gold, basically. Ah, uh, yeah. So the public was behind her. The public was completely behind her, and they thought that three out of three, she should have won gold. But it's fascinating to me that she basically it was like half gold half silver for two out of three events so, right i mean exactly. that's pr- it's pretty fascinating yeah well regardless that pr campaign was uh still in full effect because she came home to parades aplenty after the olympics babe used that opportunity to get a court decree that she could sign her own contracts as well as handle legal matters because Unmarried women were not allowed to at the time. Oh, that's crazy. Right, exactly. So B marketed herself with help from Tiny Spurlock, a newspaper man. Now, he was not her manager because if she had a manager, she would lose amateur status. But really, he was acting as her manager nonetheless. (laughs) Yep, that's pretty, that's uh, consistent with her. Yep, exactly. And both of them would tell grand stories of Babe's accomplishments and make sure they kept her name in the papers and in the public eye. So Babe continued with basketball until she got in trouble in 1933. Oh, of course. There was only two professional sports that were paid sports for women. They were tennis and they were golf. All the other sports women could play as long as they kept amateur status. That meaning not having a manager and not being paid for any endorsement of products. So from a competitive point of view, at that time, it was better to stay amateur because there was way more competitions. There was a chance to improve your game and work up the ranks. In basketball for women, there was amateur, but there wasn't a WNBA yet. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, there wasn't even a professional basketball league for her to even go into. So she needed to stay amateur to play, basically. Huh. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Okay, that makes sense. Well, in 1933, how she got in trouble was that Dodge ran an ad with a picture of Babe. Babe was not paid. However, she was still barred from the Amateur Athletic Union contest. In protest, she quit the basketball team and she held a press conference. And this got the AAU's attention and they reinstated her. But then Babe turned around and signed a contract to be a legitimate spokesperson for the Chrysler Motor Company and immediately lost her amateur status once again. Oh my gosh. (laughs) 
<laughs> I don't think she likes being told what she can and can't do. <laughs> I don't think so either. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I kind of understand it. Yeah. Right. Um, so she worked to get money and more fame any way that she could. So Babe was actually a headline performer at Chicago's Palace Theater. She sang, she played harmonica, she told jokes, and she showed off her athleticism. Babe really didn't like it. Uh, it sold tickets. It made a huge amount of money for a week. But Babe really missed the outdoors, and she missed playing something. So she quit. <laughs> I gotcha. That makes sense. Yep. So Babe tried to set up a boxing match between herself and Babe Ruth. Oh, my gosh. It never panned out, but it was really beautiful in the papers. It was going to be Babe versus Babe. Oh, wow. And it would have packed a house for sure, but it did not happen. (laughs) Wow. Now That's gutsy. Yeah, exactly, right? (laughs) Now, Babe says to have a Billard's exposition uh, with Ruth McGinnis. And there's no records and there's no eyewitness of any of this though uh tiny even lied saying that babe toured nationally shooting pool but she never did (laughs) so that was her billiards run that she had right now she did get a guest spot as a basketball player for the brooklyn yankees team uh where she actually won against the long island ducklings and she won an actual duck oh my gosh (laughs) Right. So, you know, sometimes you just you want to just play and it's like, oh, I win a duck. Cool. That sounds great. I will send it home to mom and dad. Pretty much. Yeah. (laughs) Babe was hoping to get enough money together to be able to be better at golf with trainers because she wanted to be able to compete at a professional level and actually be able to make a living at it. But life got really complicated. Babe was sending home money, but there was less and less that she could now send home. Then Babe got into a car accident where another driver actually died. The lawyers were involved, and it was a hot mess. Oh, wow. Not too soon after, her father got sick, and the family could only afford to send him to a university charity hospital. And this really kind of annoyed Babe in the sense of, why can't I take care of my family? Um, She needed money, and she needed fast to be able to take care of her family. So a promoter offered to create a basketball team for her. Uh, the Babe Dickerson All Americans and have them tour America. So as I was researching this, I was like, "Oh, like the Harlem Globetrotters, you know, a touring, non-competitive group, right?" right. And I wondered, like, which one came first? Well, the all-black Harlem Globetrotters started in 1926, so they came first. Oh wow! But the interesting thing is. Babe Mm. and the Harlem Globetrotters played against each other. They actually had a game. Yeah. So it was hugely taboo uh, to be an interracial game, but also a mixed gender game at the same time. So I would have loved to have seen this game. And I'm just like making a note to put it on my time travel itinerary. Oh, my gosh. Like when that technology is available. Like, I want to see that game. Yeah, that (laughs) sounds pretty fantastic. Yeah. And like we'd get in a fight somehow. Right, exactly. But it'd all be play fighting because it's the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah, (laughs) that's so true. That is so true. (laughs) It's like play fighting and trash talking. It would be awesome. It would be so great. (laughs) It would be great. I don't know which team I would root for the most, but you know. Both. Both. Just both. Just both, yeah. (laughs) Now, after the basketball season was over, a promoter hooked up Babe with a baseball team called the House of David, which was an all-male team at the time. This actually helped the team and baseball greatly by packing the stadiums with people during the Great Depression. Babe brought all the people. Now, the headlines mentioned how a famous woman athlete pitched for the Whisker team. She was earning between $1,000 and $1,500 a month playing baseball. She worked and played hard, and all through her life, she sent home money to her family. So she was on a, a bit of a, an upswing at yeah. this point. No pun intended. Ah, I saw I what you that did was. there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Now, there isn't much on her baseball career. Um, that with her all of her success in the many, many other sports that she played. But maybe because um, to Babe, baseball acted more as an entertainment job than a sports job. Right. Now, what I mean by this is her competitiveness kind of changed and shifted to wanting to entertain people. 
That's not to say that she wasn't a good athlete or good at playing baseball. She was still an above average pitcher, but her pitches were still hittable. So the teams agreed to kind of rig the system and miss her pitches in order to bring a bigger crowd and help everyone keep their jobs, essentially. So they helped glorify Babe's um, identity and and her showmanship more. Right. So half of it was she really was good, and half of it was like, no, we made her look good type of thing. Yeah, and this was a very popular thing in the 30s and 40s, even in with movie stars, you know what I mean? This totally, kind of yeah. fake life in front of cameras, and then yeah, yeah, it's absolutely it's unfortunately the time. I'm not happy about it. <laughs> exactly. Apparently, her batting did not need any help. She was good at hitting home runs. She scored runs, and she said that though um, she was such a crowd pleaser that when there were less people. She was pretty much useless. Yeah. So when there was a crowd, she put on sideshows. She entertained people. So definitely definitely a crowd pleaser. Definitely an entertainer. Well, she was finally ready to make her mark on golf. Um, I think she was biting time, um, trying to get enough money to, you know, eventually play a sport where she could make a living at. But golf right. was also uh, respectable. Um, but endorsements were not going to come until she was really good and winning top championships. Her right. personality and her PR department were not going to get her that. She had to be really good. So she put on herself uh, to be more ladylike. She decided with golf, oh man, I really got to put a focus on my skills because if I put a focus on my skills and not my gender and look more ladylike, I will blend in and my talents will be the story. Does that make sense? Yeah, You know totally. what I mean? So she was obsessive in practice. In Susan Clayfield's book uh, about Babe, she wrote, quote, Stan Curtis, one of her coaches, watched in awe as she hit 1,500 balls every day off the tee, trying to improve her power and distance. She got to practice tee at 9 in the morning and often stayed there until the place closed at midnight. Wow. Admiration turned to worry when Curtis noticed her hands were frequently bleeding from so much work. He made her wear gloves and finally begged her to rest, end quote. Wow. Girl was really going for it. <laughs> yeah. So she challenged male golf pros, hoping to gain actually tutoring, uh, as well as, you know, kind of light that fire of competition, right? Well, yeah. when I say challenged, it was kind of humiliating them. Uh, if they turned her down nicely, she would offer to play dolls with them instead. That oh. usually got them to play the game with her. <laughs> wow. Yeah, exactly. She kind of pulled some punches a little bit there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, during the games, Babe would not only call the press so that they could write about the friendly competition, but she would work the crowd. She was doing something new which was in a very quiet sport. Normally oh, people yeah. don't talk to the crowd in golf, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, golf is a very quiet, like there's a reason it's called a golf clap, you know? Right, exactly. It's kind of like library voices. <laughs> it, it is. It really is. Yes, not not in Babe's game. Yeah. So these exhibition games and a tour with Gene Sorensen not mm. only made her some good money, but it did get her an endorsement deal with P. Goldsmith Sun Sports Goods Company. So Babe planned to compete in the women's amateur tournaments for money and notoriety. But after winning one game hosted by the Snooty Country Club, and for those of you thinking Caddyshack, you are not far off, <laughs> <laughs> Babe was banned from playing in the amateur competitions because she had been paid in other sports. Oh my gosh. Uh-huh. It was a deliberate attack specifically on Babe. Babe had ruffled the feathers of the women like Peggy Chandler, a member of the Texas Women's Golf Association, who said, quote, we really don't need any truck drivers driver's daughters in our tournament oh jeez. yeah she didn't hold back either <laughs> yeah so they didn't want an independent meaning non-married uh woman who was not born into money on their courses that's the respectable part of golf right wow so babe had to go pro uh, she wasn't ready, but she was stuck between a rock and a hard place. There was only one professional match that was actually open to women at the time. So she was pro and had one tournament a year she could do. 
That was tough. So with the help of Bertha and R.L. Bowen, Babe got to know more female golfers that weren't as uppity as her first encounter. Uh, And also new tournaments were created for her, like the Texas Women's Open. It was open to both professionals and to amateurs. Now, the Bowens also helped Babe feel more confident in her femininity. At least that's the way that I kind of like to think of it. Susan's book says, quote, To use a Texas metaphor, Bertha Bowen was trying to break Babe, a wild pony, into accepting a saddle. (laughs) Oh, wow. Now, I... I really don't gel with that idea of being broken into submission. <laughs> um, you know, but from what I researched, uh, Babe really didn't like it either. So right. <laughs> I guess it's fair, right? <laughs> right. Now, Babe's transformation into more femininity, even through her resistance, did wow the critics who throughout her career called her names and made fun of her mannish looks and demeanor. Uh, Paul Galicchio, who wrote uh, bad, bad things about her, once he he saw her transformation he said quote the tomboy had suddenly grown up now babe met george zaharius in 1938 at a men's golf tournament now george was a wrestler famously known as being the villain or the bad guy the villainry was an act of course and it was to draw audiences and to entertain much like babe's sideshows and acts in her other sports Now, George was upset at first about going against a girl in a golf tournament, but he actually won by a single stroke. Now, in the book, it suggests maybe Babe let him win because they kind of had a thing for each other when they first saw each other, but it's not... It's you not, never really know, right? You it's never like know. Said, like she it was said. Ne- right. It's not confirmed. It's like, eh. Uh, so, I don't know. Either way, it's cute. It is cute. I'd like to think she gave him the win, but that's just me. <laughs> I do, too. I, do. I, I, I would think that would be her only way of flirting. <laughs> I, f- I feel like, yes, I, I completely agree with that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> now, after their initial meeting, they went on their first date, and they dated for about six months and then got engaged. Now, their families were thrilled. Both of their parents were immigrants. They were still learning how to integrate into this new country. Now, after six months of being engaged, their schedules were crazy. They couldn't figure out when to get married. They, they just, they were too busy. George finally decided, okay, let's marry this week or not at all. And so they did in January of 1939 with only two of their friends in attendance. None of their family could attend because of the short notice, and they did not have a honeymoon. Now, Babe was hoping for a somewhat more settled married life, but George booked both herself steadily in golf tournaments and himself in wrestling tournaments. So they had no time to see each other still, much less plan something like a honeymoon. Now, Babe grew increasingly unhappy. She had no money saved anymore. She was not advancing her career. She was traveling. She was lonely. She was being controlled by her husband without actually having her husband at her side. Now, not to mention the fact that the papers were even saying that she was, quote, pathetic as a woman until she got married, Uh. which would infuriate me. Oh, my gosh. Right. They did stay together, though. George even made it a point to get her to play in Australia, which is somewhere that Babe always wanted to go. Now, George called himself a sweetheart, a husband, manager, and advisor, which... Uh, some of those are just, true. No, I'm just some kidding. Of those, he was yeah. sweet, sweetheart at times, yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sometimes, at I first. I think they then, both had moods, so you I think know, it's that's almost fair. fair. <laughs> you know, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah, they, they were both, you know, they were both show people in a sports world. You know what I mean? Right, so, yeah. It's almost so one of those it. too much alike, almost. Almost, yeah. Mm. <laughs> a good match on paper. Exactly. Interesting, you know, when it when the room is quiet and there isn't a crowd and there isn't a game to play, you know, right. then it's interesting. Yeah. Right. So Babe really wanted to get her amateur status back in golf because remember in the pros, there was only the two tournaments, hence the boredom. In 1940, she actually won both of the tournaments that she could qualify for. So it's yeah, like, well, that's done. A <laughs> All right. right. And now what's next? <laughs> now what do I do? Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, America entered World War II, and golf tournaments turned into celebrity tournaments to benefit the war effort. So Babe played against movie stars and Olympians, but one interesting one really stood out. Our Babe played golf against the Babe. That's right. She finally got her Babe Ruth (laughs) versus Babe Zaharias now. Uh, They finally competed against each other for something. At least it wasn't boxing. It was golf. (laughs) Yeah, at least nobody broke their face. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, So Babe would finally get her amateur status back in 1945, and she started winning right away. Sports Illustrated credited her with, quote, creating big-time women's golf. They said, quote, she launched it in to a legitimate sport and brought gusts of freshness to a fun game that is often too grim. So basically, she kind of made a name for golf as being fun. <laughs> Yay! Right? <laughs> so Babe was famous for her 250-yard drive. She was also loved because she worked that crowd with jokes and showing off trick shots. The crowd would cheer for her and they would give her an edge over her competitors. The year of her big comeback, uh, she not only won the Texas Women's Open and the Western Open, but she was also named Women Athlete of the Year by the Associated Press. It had been 13 years since she had that honor before with her Olympic wins. Wow. So she got that one back again. Yeah. Yeah. So for the next two years, Babe had her mindset on a winning streak. Now, she said she won 17 tournaments in a row. But she won three, then she lost one, and then she won 14. So, yeah, 17, but not in a row. (laughs) Right. It was close. Yeah, exactly. So, overall, Babe's golf records are just simply amazing. Like, I'm amazed by it, and I know nothing about golf. She won a total of 82 golf tournaments. She won the world championship four times. She is one of only two players to win both the U.S. Women's Amateur and the U.S. Open. Uh, Shout out to Lewis Suggs, who is the other woman to do so as well. Babe was the first American woman to win the British Women's Amateur. And I might be mistaken here, but I believe that I digested this information right, that she played in the men's PGA four times. In 1938, she played in three different tournaments and then she also played again in 1945 so i count that as four yeah exactly i'm pretty sure that's right and then in 1948 she applied to play in the u.s open but she was rejected because it was open to men only and they were really legit you know strict about that one (laughs) oh my gosh right i roll Exactly. Different time. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Now, as you were saying, after winning everything she could as an amateur, Babe became a professional in 1947. Now, Fred Cochran, the agent who represented some of the area's biggest baseball stars, represented Babe with an eye toward creating a new professional tournament for women. Now, in England, they called them ladies, and in a way, it sounded classier than women, Fred said. We decided to call our tour the Ladies Professional Golf Association, or the LPGA. It could be said that they formed the LPGA just for Babe. She was one of the greatest athletes at the time, and on top of that, she put on a show along with her skilled playing. The tour's early years were not easy. They had a hard time getting sponsorships for people to invest money in the LPGA. Some of the golf courses were in ugly condition. They were parched or um, they were chopped up by overuse. Um, And the women who played stayed in cheap, crummy motels. And no one seemed to be making anybody any money except for Babe. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now she acted as she as if she owned the tour and her competitors noticed and she kind of almost did. She showed up in clubhouses before tournaments and she bellowed at the women, "Hey girls, the babe is here. Who now who's going to finish second?" Now, no wonder she doesn't really make lots of friends cuz that would make me a little angry too. I know. She's psyching. She's trying to psych them out. She's trying to do, you know, the mental yeah, game, and it's she like she is. It's I going know, a but they are far. your yeah. It's it's really tough. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's like uh, come on, babe. Now she was the star of the show. She played it up, and she knew the best, and and she she knew it. She knew to play it up because she knew it would bring in people, and therefore 
more people equals more money. Now, Babe won a tournament named after her, the Babe Zaharias Open of her hometown in Beaumont, Texas. Now, by 1950, she had won every golf title available. I know, right? Yeah. Crazy. (laughs) And she accomplished it, you know? Right, exactly. Well, in 1950, Babe met Betty Dodd. Betty was a golfer from San Antonio, Texas, and experts say that she was a very promising golfer. And Babe took her under her wing. Betty thought everything about Babe was wonderful, and the two would form a loving relationship and be together until Babe's death. Now, Babe downplayed their relationship with Betty from the public eye. In the 1950s, it was dangerous to admit a gay relationship. Her career and even her life would be in danger. So as secretive as it was to the public, Babe and Betty and George wanted to settle in Florida. When it was time to buy a house, not any house would do. So how about a golf course, right? (laughs) (laughs) So they bought the Tampa Golf and Country Club, and they changed the clubhouse to be their own personal house and renamed named it the Rainbow Manor. Isn't that cute? (laughs) that is adorable. Well, in 1952, Babe made a cameo in the movie Pat and Mike. And my goodness, do I really need to see this movie. It was out of print for a while, so I've actually missed it. And I even mentioned it on the Gals Guide podcast that it's one sports movie I really want to see and haven't seen. Yeah, well, Babe's in it. Um, Pat Mike actually stars Catherine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. And Kate plays a sports sensation who is in a golf championship. And Spencer plays her promoter who is secretly falling in love with her. So basically, yes, the Babe Zaharias inspired story. You know what I mean? It's really the story of Babe. Yeah. Uh, Now, the script called for Babe to play herself. Uh, and to lose by one stroke to Kate's character. Yeah, well, Babe refused that, and uh, the scene was rewritten. Cause yeah, Babe, no, that's not surprised. Babe's like, I don't lose in real life. I'm not going to lose in a movie. <laughs> yeah, whoever asked her to do that did not know yep. Babe well. <laughs> it was like, nice try. I understand. Not happening. <laughs> yeah, basically. It's like, we know not to do that. Don't ask that. Yep. <laughs> you want her to lose on... Per- no. That's no, not how no, this there's goes. not that much movie magic in the world. <laughs> Yeah. (laughs) Yep. Now, Babe was starting to get pain that she just couldn't shake. She would push through that newly established Beaumont Babe Zaharias Open Tournament to win by one stroke. So take that, Catherine Hepburn. Uh, But Babe really was in terrible pain, and she nearly collapsed after the tournament. She was diagnosed with colon cancer in 1953. So surgery followed, and she was outfitted with a colostomy bag, which she continued to play golf with for the rest of her life. Betty and George also did not leave her side. The cancer from her colon was considered to be removed. However, it had already spread to her lymph nodes. Betty and George knew, but they didn't tell Babe that maybe she had a year to live. Oh, wow. That's a tough secret to keep. Yes, exactly. So after resting up, Babe became a spokeswoman for cancer survivors. She was on the Ed Sullivan Show, uh, where her and Betty did a musical number and talked about benefiting uh, organizations to help cancer research. It only made sense after her wonderful musical stint on the Ed Sullivan Show that the two of them, Babe and Betty, would record a record. So there's actually a record (laughs) that Babe also made as well. (laughs) What? Add oh musician my gosh. to the list of accomplishments, right? <laughs> Wow. So Babe became a new kind of role model. People really thought that, as Babe would say, she would lick cancer. Uh, She brought awareness to the disease, and she got a lot of people to raise money for cancer research in the process. Now, her game was suffering a bit, and that's understandable to me, for crying out loud. Uh, But it wasn't to Babe. She wanted to win. And she said in the 1954 Serbian Women's Open, where she won by one stroke, that that was, quote, her biggest thrill in sports. I wow. think in that match, she overcame her greatest adversary, which was her own doubt on whether or not she could play. I think that's why that was her best game. Yeah. yeah. So the year continued to be awesome for her. President Eisenhower invited Babe to the White House to receive the American Cancer Society's Sword of Hope. She won five tournaments. Uh, She won the All-American again, and she was named the Female Athlete of the Year for the sixth time. Uh, She was also reelected as president of the LPGA. So things were going really, really, really good. 
But then the pain came back, and this time it permanently benched her. The cancer was more aggressive, and Babe did not want to admit defeat, but it was very clear that this time she was not going to win. So Babe made sure that her legacy was intact, and she dictated a book that is called This Life I've Led, which is unfortunately currently out of print, but hopefully still copies out there. Right. Babe also started a cancer fund in her name as well. So wow. Babe died September 27th, 1956, in Galveston Hospital. She was only 45 years old. She's buried in Beaumont at Forest Park Cemetery, across from the country club that she first played golf. Wow. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. So yes, golf, I think, was her main main sports love. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. She played lots yeah. of sports, but I, I think... She loved golf the most. Yeah. She had to work the hardest so. for it is probably she what really it is. She really did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what legacy do you think Babe left behind? This one's difficult for me. I feel like Babe in a sentence summed up would be sports and family. Her legacy is like you can, whatever you set your mind to do it, you can do it. And the obstacles in front of you, you can push through them. It's very interesting. I also, I tend to think about, like, her playing dirty, too. Like, I don't know. Yeah. What the, I haven't quite pegged her, I guess. It's like, okay, she played dirty, but also people say she's really sweet and very nice, and but she's so competitive. So it's like this, you know, it's this She's uh, a complex human being. She yeah. is, yeah. Def- very much so. Humanitarian is what Susan's book really believes that Babe wanted her legacy to be. Uh, much more than her sports career. And as much as I kind of understand that, I really think that was just the last years of Babe's life when she was struggling to play. Yeah, because definitely. when she could play, I think that her her legacy was something else. You know what I mean? The, those mm-hmm. last years of her life, I think she just, she shifted, understandably so. Um, but she spent a majority of her life in competition. And I think that legacy was that limitations, only limitations on athletes is their body mind. If right. the body is capable and the mind is determined, it doesn't matter what the sport is and it doesn't matter what the gender is. And I think that was more of her legacy. But also, you know, Babe broke rules and I love a rule breaker. So yeah, <laughs> that's kind of a nice legacy as well. You know, um, she was limited to only three Olympic games, but, you know, she did really good in all of those um so there's that and you know what would have happened if she was allowed to compete in more sports i mean she would probably win you know right Um, yeah probably so yeah i mean i think her legacy was paving the way for women to be thought of as strong athletes in various fields uh you can pick one or you pick all of them and babe teaches you you know that you play to win and you get the money and you send it back to family so you know yep. girls got to eat and uh, girls got to make her family proud so absolutely yeah that's what i was thinking what did you learn from babe she's a tough study definitely being a rule breaker like it's it's okay to play dirty sometimes like maybe you don't make as many friends that way but at the same time sometimes rules are in fact made to be broken and babe right. Babe went for it. And also determination and perseverance. That is inspiring. Yeah. One big takeaway for me is like, okay, it's okay if I work hard and push past the pain. Like, I don't have to sit here and be like, oh, woe is me. My legs hurt. I can be like, okay. No, I'm going to push past this because if Babe can do it, I can do it type of thing. Right. You know? uh, for me, the big lesson that I learned from Babe is that sometimes you don't get the role model you want. You get the role model you need. <laughs> yeah. Oh, was yeah. Not, I love that. She was, yeah, she wasn't perfect. She no. was really not clean around the edges. She right. is complex. I mean, she's trash talking. She's ego driven. She's rule breaking. Right. She played everything. Yeah. She won everything. <laughs> I mean, earlier I was just like, I'm having a hard time. You know, getting behind Babe, like I really want, right. I really want to like her, but sometimes it's hard. The whole trash talking thing is not my jam, but I mean, right. there's still lessons to be learned from her. You know? Oh yeah, but I mean, I've seen a lot of male players do it. That's <laughs> so true. The years, okay, you know, that is it's so like, true. It's it's part of the game, the psychological part of the game. But because she was female. Um, and that is not normally seen and frowned upon. She did change the game. It's like, wait, women can do that. Women can play like the guys do. Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So, I mean, she really did um, change the perception of female athletes to athletic and not delicate. I think yeah. that was one thing. Because even the trash talking, I mean, you have the physicality of not being, you know, delicate. That she can throw a javelin, you know, and that she can do a 250, you know, yard golf swing. But mm-hmm. also uh, her trash talking. She's not delicate. She's not a flower. No, no. <laughs> so all around, she's changing what it looks like. So, and also, I don't think Babe wanted to be a role model. No, I don't think so. No. Yeah, because in her time, if she looked at other role models that were women out there, they were perfect, you know, and mm-hmm. or at least the press would say that they're perfect. And I think her role models were men. And for the longest time, she just acted like them. And she was either yep. love for it or she was hated for it. But it's like, this is what I know. This is what other people do around me. And so that's just what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. She also, because she's the first and because she's early on, she also didn't have a role model. You know, yeah. um, she had no roadmap of uh, what uh, an all-around sports athlete is supposed to look like. She just wanted to play. She wanted that public acceptance, and she was willing to change, like, her hair and makeup. But she right. wasn't willing to uh, change all of her because it was up to us to accept who she is and like it or don't like it. <laughs> right. She at least wasn't doing that. She's like, physically, I will change a little bit and I will kind of learn how to sit in a skirt. But you know what? You're going to have to accept me who I am because I'm good. I'm good at what I do. <laughs> yep, exactly. I-, I learned to accept babe at who she was. And I think everybody wants that little piece of babe's confidence. Um, oh, yeah. It's just a little piece of it. You know what I mean? In, in whatever field, career, interest, passion you have, to have a, just, oh, goodness, a nugget of babe's confidence would go a long, long way. <laughs> it really would, yeah. Yes. Well, do you have any final thoughts? Well, I just remembered one random thing that I forgot to mention was babe's last name, Didrickson, used to spelled with S-E-N. But one of the papers spelled it S O N, and she never um, corrected it oh, because she liked it sounded. Yeah, well, it sounded more American, and she wanted to right. blend in with the American culture around her. Right, exactly. Yeah, it was definitely a big deal at the time. I know uh, my family's name uh, changed by a letter just to make it more American. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, uh, another one is I mentioned at the top of the show uh, about bowling, and it really yeah. kind of like didn't fit anywhere. So her bowling thing. So right. in 1941, um, Babe was uh, she was bored. She only had the two professional golf tournaments that she could play. So uh, bowling rules, however, allowed her to compete as an amateur, even though she got paid in other sports. It was mm-hmm. one of the few that would let her do that. She was, she played for King's Jewelry team of Southern California. And yeah, they got the league championship. So, (laughs) you know, I mean, surprisingly, she won that too. But Babe competed in bowling for two years uh, while she waited to get back into golf. And uh, yeah, they were winning everything. That's, of (laughs) course. Yeah, that makes sense. (laughs) Exactly. So for any bowling lovers out there, they're like, wait, what did she do in bowling? Yeah. That's what she did. In her time off, she won a whole bunch of league championships for bowling. (laughs) (laughs) She's amazing exactly well that wraps it up for us next week we are stepping into the ring with the goddess of bullfighting conchita cintron until then we leave you with this quote from babe watch close boys because you're watching the best for more information about this week's gal or to check out our previous episodes visit galsguide.org to support the show visit the gals guide patreon page We love our patrons and offer exclusive perks and behind-the-scenes access for as little as $1 a month. Thank you so much for subscribing to Your Gal Friday.